Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today, I finally bring you another reading vlog. It's been crazy these past couple of months, so I do apologize on that. Let's do it. The first one on the list here is Sugumi Project Volume 2. I did a first impressions video on that first volume if you're interested in checking it out. And this just continues that adventure as you have the main protagonist continuing the quest to find the Tora Tsugumi a mysterious weapon from ages past here in post-apocalyptic Japan. He is joined by Dodo, a fellow prisoner, Sugumi, the bird-legged girl, and Tora, the giant monster lion cat thingamajig. He's awesome. But the main thing that happens here is that they find one of the station facilities that was like a bunker for the previous generation, I guess, and once inside, they discover that one of the last persons that died there had a journal. And in that journal, it details some of what they've experienced so far and offers some clues about the weapon and all the future stuff that's going to happen in later volumes. The art is breathtaking and badass. I do think Ipatu has done a magnificent job. This is an action series through and through. Overall, highly recommend checking out Tsugumi Project. We finally have another volume of Rooster Fighter, and the last one left on a bit of a cliffhanger, as our main cock here had an impossible task of protecting the town from a dam that was breaking, a massive flood and wave was going to basically wipe everything off the map, and he had made friends with this uh, demon creature that wasn't as bad as the other evildoers in this manga. He was actually pretty friendly and wholesome, and what soon follows is the reveal that uh, Keiji, our lovable rooster here, has a brother, and the history behind that, and why this brother is now here asking for help for a particular mission that involves another family member, which I'll leave for you to find out if you decide to read uh, Rooster Fighter. But the art is crisp, nice, and badass at times, and sometimes beautiful too, with the way the animals are drawn and the monster designs are all grotesque and pretty cool to see as well. I hope you're interested enough by these visuals to go check it out as well. The next one here is The Valiant Must Fall, Volume 2 from Yu Aida. And I gotta say, one of the best and worst things about this series is that it is historical fiction, but it is also very dense in said history. And I completely forgot what I read with Volume 1, so I had to go back, went through my notes on Volume 1. The story fortunately continues to excel. I do think this is a wonderful samurai action series that if you're a fan of something like Blade of the Immortal, you're gonna enjoy this one. We follow Haruyasu along with Kyoko Shino as they seek the legendary mythical blade weapon to put an end to Shino's mother who happens to be an immortal and she has been eternally suffering as a result and the government is against these actions, of course, so they're gonna send people after them. Of course, they meet new characters that help them along the way. We lose some people as well. Some very melodramatic things happen in this volume, but in a good way. I love the art, and here you get some really nice, defined, uh, beautiful looking characters. I do recommend this story if you like historical fiction, and samurai action. Definitely check out uh, The Valiant Must Fall. Level 1 Demon Lord and One Room Hero. Here we have Volume 5. We finally have the other side of the equation as this new arc introduces the rest of the demons from the Demon Realm. Now, these characters are a little upset that our main uh, Demon Lord, after being resurrected, decided to skip his duties of restoring the kingdom, if you will, and is now having fun adventures with Max the hero in the human realm. So we get a really nice, somewhat shocking introduction to these characters, which we've only heard about so far. We've only seen two or three in the past, but now we get the full gamut of lieutenants and captains and all that stuff that are slowly being introduced 
So yeah, this is really cool. I love, of course, that this series doesn't take itself too seriously, but it knows when to up the ante on the drama and action and all that stuff. I love the art. Highly recommend it if you're interested in this sort of thing to check out uh, Level 1 Demon Lord and One Room Hero. Ah yes, my guilty pleasure, Rent a Girlfriend. Here we have volume 20 and similar with the Sugumi Project. As I'm recording this, I actually did get volume 21, but I haven't read it. So I'll just give you my quick thoughts on this volume instead. We finally have the resolution of the movie screening arc. Finally, Mizuhara is able to present to the film after the tragedy that happened in the previous volumes. But the main thing here is that Akazuya, he's feeling a little bit down that after this project, it could mean that they'll go their separate ways, Mizuhara and Kazuya. But something happens in this volume that may give our main protagonist the opportunity that he's waited for, for that honest love confession. It's honestly more of the same. Uh, some of the volumes before this uh, let me down somewhat, especially with Kazuya and the way that he went about things after the tragedy that happened like two volumes ago. So this one kind of redeemed itself a little bit, brought back some of the humor, reintroduced some of the other characters like Mami-chan, who had been absent for quite some time. So it, it definitely brought back uh, the first couple of chapters, or if you, you watch the anime, it brought back like season one vibes, which is always fun to see. One of my favorite releases from Seven Seas is Dinosaur Sanctuary. I love dinosaurs and I love the concept of this book. In this particular volume, the character of Suma Suzume is still trying to find her place in Dino Land and uh, she gets to meet the character of Igarashi Keisuke, which is here on the uh, cover and they go on more episodic adventures throughout the park with different dinosaurs and different scenarios that zookeepers might face. In real life, we see that displayed here in the manga. What's cool about Volume 3, of course, is that at the start, we get a really awesome park guide and map, which reminds me of the maps that you would see at Disney World, for example, with all the uh, uh, visiting hours and gift shops and all that stuff. That is really cool. The art on this is awesome as always. Great attention to detail to the creatures and the human characters as well. Some really believable storylines and some really human stories that are just accentuated or highlighted by dinosaurs. Toge Oni, Volume 1, Primal Gods and Ancient Times. This is by Kenji Surubuchi. And I have to admit, at first when I started reading, I had a little bit of a tough time with this. I don't know if it's the pacing or some of the dialogue for these characters. I thought it was a little bit all over the place at times, but I gave it another shot before making this video and I really enjoyed it. This is a story before stories were made. It's like in the ancient times before recorded history. I assume it's supposed to be Japan. And you have this character that is scheduled to be sacrificed for the land but she gets an opportunity when a traveling priest with two assistants venture into the land and some hijinks ensue and our main character is able to go with them now this is a land filled with magic and i guess uh like ancient gods and there are time travel elements there are some alternate dimensions it has a lot of concepts that sometimes i feel like it was a little bit muddy in its execution the ancient god designs look really crazy and something out of a video game there are some evil creatures present in the book and their designs are pretty well made as well uh, overall i did enjoy this it's it's fun it's a little bit tricky at first with so many concepts thrown at you that i feel like that second read through really helped me out uh, appreciate this volume even more and now i'm excited for volume two which is coming out in a couple weeks as of me making this video Sawara and the House of Monsters, Volume 1 from Hidenori Yamaji. This is pretty awesome. Also one of my favorite reads of the year and one of my most anticipated books of the year, I should say. This follows the character of Sawara, a young orphan girl raised by knights, 
and she was trained from an early age to fight in this war against monsters. And the twist here at the start is that peace is achieved before Sawada can actually go to the battlefield. Now, not having anything to do, she is given the task to just venture out and explore the land and find a life for herself. But what life can she find when all that she's known is just training for combat and killing monsters? It just so happens that she stumbles upon a house or a cave of goblins that are seeking the help of a team of workers. One of them is named Kirik. He is a very famous dwarf and he reminded me of Reg from Made in Abyss which I thought was pretty funny. Sawada meets these characters and they proceed to build a really cool house for the goblins and you see the care that goes into that and this manga has a really fun time of showing you the diagrams and how everything's built and set up. So yeah, the art on this is super clean and nice. I like the cartoonish character designs. The monster designs are great. And uh, it was nice to see Soada break out of her shell and start to realize that peace is here and these monsters don't want to fight. And now she has to find this life for herself outside of that prejudice and anger for monsters. And of course, Kirik is going to teach her that lesson by employing her for her group and all that stuff. If you like stuff like Delicious in Dungeon, for example, you get some of that where you have episodic adventures, understanding the uh, world building of this place. Definitely do give Sawada and the House of Monsters a shot. Hashtag DRCL. I'm pretty sure that's not how you're supposed to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. Here is Midnight Children, uh, Volume 1 from Shinichi Sakamoto. This is the manga adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, the novel. I foolishly thought this just was Volume 1 out of Volume 2. I did not realize that this is a currently ongoing series from uh, Mr. Sakamoto. So, yeah. That blunder aside, I was really excited to check this out. Shinichi Sakamoto, easily one of the best artists out there in the world right now, and this does not disappoint. The art on DRCL is the highest selling point that I want you to take notice, because if you like the art, you definitely want to own this book. It is rich in detail, beautiful to look at, even when you're presented with the most grotesque images, you are still marveling at the pencils and craftsmanship from uh, Shinichi Sakamoto. So yeah, this is a pretty loose adaptation of Dracula. There are a lot more elements introduced, a lot more uh, manga-esque tropes, if you will, that are sprinkled throughout. And I have to admit, I needed to do my homework on the original novel because it's been ages and I don't think I ever read the whole thing. Just bits and pieces of it, plus the movie. There are a lot of nods to the book with the characters that are introduced and certain plot elements that take different twists and turns. So yeah, definitely do check out DRCL if one, you're a fan of Dracula and two, you're a fan of good artwork. Definitely check it out. Next up is Cat-Eyed Boy Volume 1 Hardcover from Kazuo Umez. This is one of my favorite books of the year, one of my most anticipated reads of 2023. I'm so happy to finally own this chunky hardcover. Kazuo Umez needs no introduction, a master mangaka with so many wonderful works here. Uh, this is one of my favorites because it tackles the supernatural and yokai elements with Japanese folklore and all that stuff. And that is usually what I gravitate towards when it comes to my manga reading. The actual Cat-Eyed Boy character, he is a hybrid, if you will, a yokai that is half human, half creature, and neither side wants him. They all think he is a bad omen, a curse. So as a result, you have a character that's been a loner throughout his old life and um, is more of a prankster these days where he's staying at human houses and causing mischief. He's just staying at the attic of a house and this family is being targeted by this zombified ghoulish looking man. Of course, tragedy strikes and the character moves on to another house and 
It's sort of uh, that type of storytelling. Sometimes the dialogue can be a little bit corny at times, but it's a product of its time. And there is a timeless nature to it because it involves folklore and that never dies. It just continues to grow and persist and evolve as the citizens and towns continue to grow as well. One of my favorite chapters in this is when you see the birth of the Cat-Eyed Boy with the really amazing splash pages of all the different yokai and monsters and creatures and all that stuff. That was one of my favorite stories for sure. So yeah, overall just a fantastic read. If you're in the mood for some 60s and 70s type horror with a twist with more uh, uh, impish creatures causing mayhem and mischief, then definitely give Cat-Eyed Boy a shot. Thankfully, it's only two hardcovers, and Volume 2 comes out in December, if I remember correctly, so I'm eagerly anticipating that book as well. Now, to finish off our little reading vlog here, I have a graphic novel that's not a manga, but it's definitely inspired by it. Here we have Bang! The Ballad of the Tiger from Josh Greathouse, friend of the channel. Josh sent this to me. He just wanted me to check out his graphic novel here and talk about it if I could. And I said, of course, yeah. So we have the character of Bang and she is wearing this huge hat, skull hat, that was from the previous army that got defeated. And the land is now ruled by a different empire, a change in power, if you will. They don't take too kindly that our spunky character had a scuffle with another character. As a show of force, they are exiling her from her town and she is forced to wonder until she is able to reflect and come back and all that stuff. So essentially, this is the story of growing up and going off on a journey. But it just so happens that there is a lot of uh, cool characters, badass uh, fight scenes and kick-ass action sprinkled throughout. So she sets off on a journey and alongside her is Eddie, who is a young boy that wanted to go to school to be a doctor. And by helping her when the officials were uh, trying to get her to leave, he committed a crime of getting her hat, which was from her late father. So now the two of them are on this adventure together. Along the way, they meet other characters like Yasmin, who is this badass with a sword. The contrasting art here with uh, simple tones, but really effective visuals, bring this world to life in a very unique way. And uh, of course, with the uh, anime influences, the fighting, I thought it, it was well paced and choreographed, easy to follow. And the characters reminded me of things like uh, Journey to the West and a little bit of Dragon Ball here and Shonen Manga. So I really enjoyed Volume 1 and I'm eagerly awaiting Volume 2. I can't wait to buy it. If you guys are interested in Bang! The Ballad of the Tiger, definitely do give this a read. You can check it out on Webtoons or buy Volume 1. And there you go, fall reading vlog done. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, it, it sucks that I had to wait so long to put this video out, but all good things come to those who wait, right? Thank you everybody for liking, commenting, subscribing, and being a part of Manga Geekdom. I truly do appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll be back soon with another reading vlog right after this. So stay tuned for that. I'd appreciate it if you check out the other content and all that wonderful stuff. Thank you everybody once again. God bless, stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next video.